Good afternoon, um, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today as part of our Disruptive Tech Series. I'm sure a few of you have attended some of our um, uh, previous webinars and you, you're familiar with the format. So my name is Colvin Stone. I'm a partner at Fox Williams and head of technology. So today's um, webinar is on the role of in-house lawyers um, in the context of corporate misconduct and uh, potential conflicts of interest, and ultimately what senior in-house lawyers can do to protect themselves and their organization. Um, and we're gonna look at this particularly through the lens of um, what's happened uh, with the um, post office horizon scandal. So please um, feel free to ask any questions uh, through the chat function and I'll try my best to weave uh, those into the conversation. Um, so to provide um, uh, insights on this really important topic, I'm delighted to welcome um, an esteemed panel of experts. So firstly, we've got Jennifer Swallow, um, who is a lawyer with extensive experience in, in helping high growth uh, tech companies. So she's had leadership roles at Yahoo, Wise and Lawtech UK. Uh, Lara Oyasanya, who is the uh, Group General Counsel and Company Secretary um, and member of the uh, executive leadership team at, at, at ZEPS, uh, formerly known as World Remit. And she's previously held senior leadership roles at Contis and Klarna and Barclays. And lastly, uh, Richard uh, Moorhead, who is a professor of law and professional ethics at the University of Exeter. And he's a leader in the film of ethics and uh, legal services. And he's looked extensively at the post office scandal and the impact on lawyers. So um, uh, moving straight into uh, the q and I'm gonna dive uh, uh, and move to you first, Richard, and be fairly direct with the first question. Can you just um, outline to us uh, what the post office prosecutions have got to do with in-house lawyers? Okay, thank you. So, um... The post office scandal sp spans over 20 years. There's a period um, sort of at, at the beginning of the period, so from about 2001 to 2013, when the post office are privately prosecuting essentially their franchisees, the sub postmasters who run their, sub, their, their branches for false accounting and theft arising from their accounting system. And the postmasters, it became clear, were saying it's a problem with the system. And the post office was saying, no, you're dishonest. Um, what that's got to do with the in-house lawyers is the in-house lawyers ran the prosecutions. They often contracted private practitioners, but they ran the prosecutions and those prosecutions were unfair. Um, they didn't make proper disclosure, so on and so forth. But in and around that, they did some of the things which more in-house more in counsel would recognize. So what I would describe as inappropriately aggressive approaches to legal risk either from the client or from the lawyers, I think, which is an interesting question in the post office scandal. Um, the the problems with the prosecutions and the system started to be investigated in various ways, which were run by or through the lawyers, partly for the reasons of professional privilege. Those investigations were reported up through the business and they were maybe not properly reported up through the business or reported in misleading ways. And that will sometimes have implicated the lawyers either in the investigations themselves the instructions or the reporting up into the business and um the business usually through the chief exec reported to politicians through select committees uh, and she made some very um, bold statements about there being an absence of evidence of miscarriages of justice that was plainly based on legal work uh, and when she was called out on the problems with that statement several years later, she simply blamed the lawyers. I, I was simply re relying on legal advice. And by the way, you can't see that legal advice because it's privileged. Well, unluckily for her, there's a public inquiry and the public inquiry has got legal professional privilege lifted. So we're now being able to see what advice was given by whom and when. So the in-house lawyers have been involved in all of that. It basically boils down to have they misled people within the business or outside of the business? Have they misled courts through civil litigation, criminal litigation, and so on? Have they misled or been complicit in the misleading of others such as Parliament? And they all engage their professional um, obligations. Um, it's worth saying, 
lest the in-house lawyers be, and I'm conscious of the audience, but this is true anyway, lest they feel under attack, private practitioners are, are equally, if not more, in the soup for this. So if you followed the story, you will know that Lord Newberger has a, a, a walk-on part, um, which will, I think, embarrass him in the long term. Lord Grabener has a walk-on part, which is a little bit more substantial still. A, a former QC, now a high court judge, has a substantial role. And uh, at least one other leading KC has a substantial role as well as role as well as one regional law firm and one quite big um, commercial law firm who many of you may even instruct. So there are lots of lawyers involved, not just in-house lawyers, but it, it's, it basically boils down to aggressive management of legal risk and misleading or being complicit in misleading either the client and or others. So just to, let me just expand on that um, a little bit. And it's, it's yeah. interesting you you mentioned that the CEO blamed the lawyers. We've seen that very recently with Sam Bankman Field in the FTX prosecution yeah. where he said, I was just acting on um, legal advice. Yeah. Um, so what do you mean by sort of aggressively managing risk and then kind of potentially kind of misleading, carrying out a misleading investigation? What, what does that what does that kind of look like? Um, well, there are lots of examples. Let me just concentrate on perhaps the best known one, which is a piece of civil litigation, the base litigation. It was a group litigation brought by 555 postmasters uh, against the post office back in 2017. And that's kind of what led us to hear bit by bit to the public inquiry. And the, uh, the post office basically mounted a, a legal case which was exceptionally argumentative they took every single evidential procedural and substantive point they could and was evidentially the polite word is flawed i suppose the pleadings were misleading some of the evidence was misleading the evidence uh, uh, and of course that might be the client's fault some of the evidence didn't match the underlying physical documents which the lawyers should have been more across and the judge makes that quite clear um, so there's that kind of strategy through the litigation. It was essentially scorched earth litigation to try to exhaust the claimants, which they did actually partly succeed in. The case settled, but it settled only after two really extraordinary judgments from the High Court judge, um, which really dropped the post office and their, to a degree their lawyers into, into the trouble, which led to the criminal court of appeal reversal and then the public inquiry. Okay, so it's some aggressive litigation and then yeah, essentially not being as thorough as they should have been. Those two things, I, I suppose, and, and just ev every single, it would be unfair to say every single, very many judgments about what the facts really mean, how the law applies to this situation, what our obligations are as prosecutors or what our obligations are as civil, as, as participants in a civil litigation. Every single question, if you like, um, uh, uh, rather strained mm. benefits of the doubts were given to the client's position uh, and that led them mm. essentially to disaster in the end mm. and, and do you think that was um, mm. uh, where was the role in management within that in terms of was it was it partly cultural or was it um, you know yeah, it's really. I mean, I, I don't think we know the answer to that yet. I mean, what we know about the post office is it was regarded as a badly managed organisation. It had a very strange governance structure because its own, the, the sole shareholder is the government. Yeah. Um. So it it gets large amounts of public subsidy. It was under enormous pressure because the, the government wanted it to be commercial, more commercial through the entirety of this process. <laughs> they faced really massive structural headwinds because people were stopping using post offices and all the things that post offices traditionally did, like administer benefits and pensions, were shifting online. So they were losing a lot of business uh, and they were trying to manage those commercial pressures yeah. and persuade government that they knew what they were doing whilst running a, 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 an accounting system which had um, uh, significant flaws in it. Okay, yeah, so... That's interesting. So there are a kind of idiosyncratic kind of set of characteristics to the post office. So turning to you, Jennifer, hmm. um, is this just a one-off that was um, hmm. something particular to the post office or is there a kind of wider issue that, that we should be thinking about as in-house lawyers? Hmm. And I think when you're facing 
gaslighting from your tech founder and standing in front of various risk trains. You, you're not thinking, oh, this is a post office mm. situation. Oh, this is my independence is I need to read the SRA code. And this is about the rule of law and administration of justice. Mm. But the truth is that is exactly what it is. The post office happened um, incrementally one step at a time. It didn't all of what we see now playing out in the inquiry didn't happen all at once. Um, and I think it's easy to point at it and say, oh, bad people did bad things over there in that corner and we can just round them up and then everything will be OK. But actually, when I attended an event in Cambridge where Richard was presenting, we did a workshop over a couple of days on some of the material and we were presented with the types of decisions that the lawyers within post office would have been faced with. And it was hard to say that you would take different decisions than appear than the ones that appear to have been taken in some cases. You know, the the Horizon um, contract, the contract between um, post office and Fujitsu for the technology, the incentive structures inside that document are very common incentive structures, very aggressive lawyering inside there represented in words that result in certain behaviors. Um, the infrastructure around governance, whilst there are idiosyncrasies, there are behaviors that many of us in the room recognized and I have to tell you I didn't feel proud about them and I'm not saying this is not lawyer bashing at all it was just a point for me of pause to go mm, that's really interesting about how we lawyer what does that then mean and then the other part of this and there's some uh, on 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 the call today that were involved in this um, uh, some of us recently complained to the regulator about their evaluation of reality in relation to what it is that GCs experience um, doing their jobs and the, the regularity of conflicts arising. And as part of that, we put a bunch of scenarios together, just very quick, anonymized scenarios of the types of things that we experience. And when you read the, that, that those types of scenarios, and every GC will have an example, you realize that it's actually very common to be faced with these types of either ethical, regulatory, professional conflict moments. And so the question then comes, well, what do we do about them? Um, and how are we how are we navigating that? The other thing that's interesting to to drop in is that there is a trend that barristers and regulatory lawyers tell me that they're seeing of GCs in house lawyers taking personal legal advice. Right. So this realization that oh, I'm in the middle of something here, and I have duties, and what does it mean for me and my job and my role, as well as what does it mean for my client and what does it mean for society? I've taken personal legal advice in relation to what I needed to be doing in a particular very challenging situation. So I think that taken with the fact that ethics is trending in society, um, I think it would be foolish to see post office some, as something separate because it is very extreme. Yeah. OK. And, and can you um, put some colour on that in terms of you mm. know the scenarios that you were talking about mm. and maybe not your own personal situation in, mm. in, in terms of when you you examples to... you mean examples yeah, exactly. so so one of the situations that we need to look out for as a general counsel senior in-house lawyer yes where actually this is a conflict this is an issue yes i think i need to go and take separate legal advice mm. and i'm not saying you do need to go and take separate legal advice yeah. because or, it should or, be or, that, or that we know yeah so the sra code requires us to act with integrity to act in the best interests of the client but also to have a mind to society the rule of law and administration of justice so where the tension exists between those two things is where you're acting for a client who's also your employer and may have influences that you aren't realizing are actually affecting your decision making or the way that you're advising so how clean are you in terms of independence in respect of how you're delivering your advice um, and some examples, there were many, quite a lot of stuff around compliance, so financial crime, bribery and corruption, risk evaluations and decisions that are taken around um, risks in relation to um, money laundering, um, particularly in relation to suppression of information or being encouraged to take a more commercial approach to the advice. Well, can't we just argue that it's this rather than that? And where is the line really? And of course, there's always an evaluation to make as a lawyer in terms of your advice, but how much are we influenced to give a very um, uh, polished view of the law versus actually saying this is something we need to be careful of? Other examples were around um, sexual harassment, bullying, abuse, 
systemic issues culturally inside an organization which crystallize in, into legal risk um, and a, a request for the lawyer to just look the other way or to polish it, to cover it up. Um, lots of situations, there was one where somebody actually got sued personally, joined into a claim um, where a, a company that had been acquired, um, the buyer um, thought that there had been a breach of warranty, which it turned out there had been some bad practice. So they joined the lawyer in the action. Um, the, the these. Counsel. They joined the general counsel in the action. And actually, in that case, that GC had the backing of the chair, which meant that they were indemnified in circumstances where they didn't have an indemnity in the contract for legal costs coverage. Um, and they got the backing of the business. Whereas you can see that if that relationship hadn't been there, it might have been a different outplay for, for, for that GC. So this is like there are lots of small examples that give a picture of, and I don't want to say that all business people are bad. That's not the case at all. It's just that the role that lawyers mm. play in guiding ethical decision making is is so important. And you need to know when you are being influenced to act in a way that the client wants you to act, potentially that you shouldn't be, that you should actually just be giving very clean legal advice and saying, you know, this is actually the position and knowing when you're being unduly influenced. And I think it goes to something that um, uh, has been written by uh, Professor Stephen Mason. He talks about the inherent tension that we have as GCs between our duties and our employer clients and the fact that there are certain things, you know, they, they're responsible for, they, they decide whether you get a bonus. You don't want to get fired because you've got a mortgage. You know, there are certain sort of additional influences that, that are at play and we need to be very aware of those. Does that make sense, Colin? Yeah, absolutely. And just um, mm. perfect. Lara's time. nodding. Yeah, perfect time <laughs> to bring Lara into the conversation. What's your, there's quite a lot to unpack in there, but what's your experiences of this tension between the employer client and the role of the, the general counsel? Um, can, can I just say um, straight away, you guys are going to have to forgive me uh, because I'm going to be very controversial. Awesome. Um, we love that. <laughs> it's a safe space here. I hear Permis everything permission that Richard forgiveness. and Jennifer have said. However, I, I just, I'm sorry. I just have to debunk the whole of that. I'm sorry. Um, let's start with the you know post office. I am shocked and I still you know want to look back to think how is it even possible that such a huge organization that has been going on forever could get to this stage to avoid first line of defense, second line of defense, mm. third line of defense, where's your enterprise risk management framework? You know, mm. how are you reporting your legal risks? I, I just cannot get my head round to the fact that you have so many claimants, you know, and it went on for so long. There's no assessment. You, ref you, you have to file a litigation report. I do that every time I go before the board, before the committee. Nobody's asking questions. I, I just, I can't get my head around it. That's number one for me because I just can't see that happening in my organization. I really cannot. And how it's happened at the post office, I went off for so long, I'm just lost for words. And I just, you know, I hear all the explanations. It still doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. So that's post office aside. Now, okay. let's talk about, you know, um, the role of um, working for your employer as um, um, a lawyer. My superpower is my independent thinking. And frankly, that's not, you know, for grabs at all and in any role that i'm in i have a voice i am very clear that my degree is worth much more because it's the degree is the certificate that gets me the next job not the current job that i'm in is my experience is my ability to do my job to the best of my ability and i always make it very clear if i cannot point out a problem i'm out because as soon as I start a job, my CV is ready. I mm, do not agree. at all, under any circumstances, mm. you know, have my independent thinking at risk for anyone. And I'm very lucky 
as an executive, as a member of the executive board, working for these organizations, all the organizations that I've worked in, I've never had to compromise my independence. And I can unpack that a bit. And I think it goes down to how as in-house lawyers, you know, we see ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's a question of relationship. It's a question of trust. When you're going into an in-house role, you don't go in into, oh, I'm a lawyer. You have to listen to what I have to say. You go in, you want to think like a business because they've not recruited you, you know, to do product or whatever, to give that advice to help them with the regulatory issues, compliance issue, complying with the law. So it's very important that you have a voice. I was at the lawyer um, event of, you know, marketing team um, last month. And one of the questions they asked me was, you know, how do we convince partners to listen to marketeers, you know, in terms of, you know, what the market is telling them and what partners should be doing. <laughs> and I said, you know, frankly, if partners are spending part of their, you know, um, income to recruit marketeers to give them information and they're not listening to them, that's a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it? Mm. You know, should you not be saying to partners, you know, that frankly, why am I here? So I, I just think, you know, you know, sometimes we need to, to be very bold and be very clear in terms of what our responsibilities are. I can't imagine, you know, saying to my CEO, you know, yes, I wear two, in fact, I wear three hats. I'm the company secretary to the main board. I'm a member of the executive board and I'm also the group general counsel. And I'm very clear, you know, in respect of each role, what my responsibilities are. When I'm talking as a group general counsel and I say to my CEO, you know, look, I don't think we should be doing this. If he doesn't listen to me, either I put a proper memo in or I raise it as a risk, which goes into our enterprise, you know, risk framework. So somebody will have to, you know, explain that because it's an identifiable risk, which goes to the board, you know, to consider. So that's why I, I just can't get my head around how the post office got to the position it got mm. to. I think can I, can I just well, yes. Sure, yeah. Jennifer, yeah, yeah, far away. Can I jump in? Because I'm really feeling yeah. Lara's power and I love that you have that. And I love that you have always instituted governance that yes. supports that independence. And that's exactly where we should be. But the reality on the street is not that because otherwise I wouldn't receive like one or two. But Jennifer, appalling... that's my point. That's, yes, that's my point. We have the power to do that. We We're do. making choices by keeping quiet and say, I don't want to lose my job or I don't want to do this. That is a conscious choice that we're making. And we're making this position to be what it is today. And Whichever way we slice it, and, and it's I a can, conscious decision not to mm -hmm. speak. Mm -hmm. No, I, 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 can, I can see that. And I can also see that, that you have a very strong personality. Um, and you guard your... Which, which in, my training and degree has given me. That's very important. And I think you see your, the, you guard your independence. Totally. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's a red line for you. I, I know that we did a session a, a couple of years ago now with um, some lawyers from um, Google and Facebook talking about product counselling. But in that context, we were talking about... Um, you know, kind of legal compliance and, and 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 launching products. And I know that the lawyer from Facebook, and she said this openly, that, you know, it was very hard to say no to the business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they were moving at pace. They had a very strong um, um, founder. Um, and that culture only changed um, post Cambridge Analytica because people saw that making the wrong decisions can have catastrophic um implications for the, for the for the business and it was only at that point that they instituted a culture of the lawyers one being involved at the outset but also um having the ability to say no and it was the same the lawyers said it's exactly the same thing at um 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 google that they have a process by which they can say no to guard um you know the lawyers independence because not everyone i think is it has the same mindset and strength of personality that-, that, that and, and I think the examples you've given, Colby, is because some lawyers actually spoke up. 
And that's the point. And I think we need to recognize that, that, you know, sometimes we can be complicit, you know, in this. Because if you don't speak up, yes, there are founders that are very, very difficult. But founders have investors. Investors want to protect the investment. They want can to I jump on? Can I jump on this point? This is so critical. What you're saying. So the thing I've found talking to all these people who message me about these terrible situations they're in, right? One of the things that's at the core of it is often that they haven't got clarity as to who their client actually is. So what Lara's just said. The investors are the business that the shareholders own the company, typically, depending on the structure, and the board represent them. And the people who are the executives are not the client. They might be the boss, but they're not the client. And that simple shift as to who am I actually serving can be very, very powerful because it might be the CTO, the CFO. You might even report to the CFO, which I think is not great. Um but when any conversation you're having with them, you can look at them and know that they're not actually who you represent as a lawyer. And that can be that can be very powerful. And in really big organizations, I've worked in them too, it's hard. Um, Calvin, you're describing Facebook and Google and particularly where it's all, you know, move fast and break things. Um, and we want to be innovative. And, and as lawyers, we want to support um, speed and innovation. Um, but the clarity as to who you're representing, if that isn't there, it means that things can get a bit more confused. I, I, I totally agree with that, but there's so many tools available to mm. us. You know, you have the whistleblowing, you know, which is also, um, you know, frankly, you know, supposed to be, um, you know, protected with that you can raise issues, you know, you can raise it all the way. Yes, there's always the risk, you know, that yes, you may be out of a job, but I think, you know, we've got to have the strength of our conviction in matters like this, because otherwise, you know, we'll continue to be the fall guy as internal, you know, you know, legal, legal counsel. And we need to stop that trend. You know, I know it's very difficult when you're still starting out, but it's one of the things that we need to start building up as we're working our way through to know and, what matters. And can I add that the, the thing that I have come to, having spoken to so many people and having had been through a situation myself that I found very challenging, and the type of support I was able to draw on, it made me think, what would we be able to do that would mean that the environment was set up so that it wasn't just the lawyer and their backbone against the business? Yeah. Like, what, 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 are, what are the, what's the infrastructure? What's the, the environment? The good governance the governance. structure. Um, yeah. Correct. The good governance structure. I also want you to think about um, and this is to, to, to everyone, Richard included, is that imagine, and we've I, I've certainly seen this trend um, with some of our um, kind of scale up startup scale up clients, is that imagine you're a three or four year qualified lawyer and you're going in taking your first in house role, totally. um, you're going in as head of legal because de facto you're the only lawyer, mm -hmm. um, and. I, I, you're not experienced actually, and there is this very strong founder um, and you want to impress what, and I totally get what you're saying, um, um, Lara, in terms of, you know, your approach, which you've built up over, over, over a period of time with some experience and, and, you know, your strength of personality. But what about that individual? Like what can they do in their situation to protect themselves? And one of them we talked about was good governance, but is, is, have you got any other kind of, Imagine you're in that scenario, then then what do you do? Yeah. I think it's good conversations. And, you know, I experience is nobody's born with experience. You acquire them over time, you know, and sometimes you sort of take examples and, you know, as you navigate your way through, you learn along the way. What I found that's been very useful when I've gone for roles is good conversations. Yes, you know, everybody wants to be head of legal, want to be general counsel. So when the opportunity arises, you want to go for it. But I think it's very important, you know, to sort of be very clear in terms of the extent of your authority and the role that you're being asked to play. Because if your role, you know, is to make sure that you are the advisor to the organization, to make sure that, you know, the legal responsibilities are adhered to, and there's less risk, you know, in terms of, you know, regulatory compliance, is to have that conversation. What if we disagree? Even with my experience, when I was taking this role, 
after I was offered it, I did not accept it until I had, you know, about 60 minutes discussion with the CEO in terms of we will disagree. And if that happens, what okay. then? Yeah, so being very clear about expectations yes. and putting in place governance. Um, Jennifer? So I think there's a few things. There's, well, there's three categories. One is internal. So the, the internal one is be really proud to be a lawyer. Be proud. Do not diminish it by saying that you're a business person first and a lawyer second. No, you've been employed because you have a legal qualification and they need that. And you know that you're bringing value to that business by doing your job really bloody well every day and that they are lucky to have you. So that's number one. Um, that relates to that's a societal aspect to that, too, that you know what your duty is in your individual job, but that you also carry something for society by way of responsibility. Second thing is communication, which is what Lara just talked about. And I'm talking here about making it alive, the fact that you have regulatory duties, non-dramatic. So that junior that's gone in as the head of legal, um, who probably doesn't even know how to build governance yet, right? How would you know if you've never done it? But starting to talk about the fact that there will be red lines, as Lara said, um, bringing those types of red lines into conversation. So when things arise, you say, well, actually, this one, this creates a conflict. Um, and you can actually be quite light in that. You know, there's sort of humor that you can even bring in in the earliest stages where you're educating them. You're essentially educating them. You're saying, well, that one, clearly you're, you're not the boss. Um, actually, the company uh, would need to make the decision ultimately on these subjects. You can be you can be playful too; doesn't have to be controversial. And you can also bring in storytelling. And um, Ben Horowitz of Andreessen Horowitz tells a great story about why he didn't get fired, why he didn't go to jail, it was because of his lawyer. And you can tell you can do storytelling around risk, which supports them to understand your uh, regulatory duties. And then the third thing in relation to infrastructure, I actually say there's a few things like governance, there's a few things you can actually do. One is add your regulatory duties to your employment contract. There's an employment contract template that I produced, which you can have a look at if that's useful to yeah. you. Stick it as an addendum onto your contract. So it's like given post office is happening, you know, the in-house community is now making clearer reference to the fact that we've all got reg duty. So we're going to undramatically add that to our employment contract. Um, you can look at reporting lines. So on the way in, of course, you have greater influence. But once you're in, it's a little bit harder. But try not to report to the CFO if you can. Make sure that you report to the boss of the boss mm -hmm. and that you have a reporting line into the chair or the non-executive director and that that means something. I would say also when something happens that you feel uncomfortable, uncomfortable about, go fast. Don't wait. Think about it too much. Just say it straight away, I feel uncomfortable about this. Teach them that you won't let things drift because in the drift, we end up in a slippery slope. Um, and then discuss, like, I mean, also have a, have a log, like Lara talked about a, a risk register, have a log, keep records. Speaking to um, a lawyer recently who said that she file notes everything like she used to do in private practice. That's maybe a bit extreme and I certainly didn't do that, but keep notes. Um, and if you've got a team, have it in the team's discussion that you're going to talk about conflicts, you're going to talk about ethics, make it normal that you're not like the master of morality standing above everybody else. There are tensions that need to be discussed. Um, so just some thoughts there, if that helps, Corbin. Yeah, that's great. I want to bring Richard into the conversation. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and also some of the questions from the audience. So one is... Um, Firstly, have you got any comments on everything you've heard, Richard? Um, two, um, how useful, and this, this is coming from the audience, how useful is the um, SRA advice line in, in matters of ethical um, dilemmas? Can I just answer that in one minute? Chocolate okay. fire guard. Chocolate fire guard. So I called them. I called them. And they would have absolutely no, no use to me whatsoever. I was educating them as to where I saw the conflict and um, they made no contribution except to, to go ooh, and then start asking questions about whether I was like, like they were going to enforce against me for failing to. So not useful at all, which wow. is why I'm looking with others at different yeah. support methodologies for, for lawyers. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. A lot of what you're saying is around awareness and understanding the role of, of, of a lawyer. And clearly, you know, the business may not 
understand that um, in the same way that we all do in private practice and the way that we've grown up in private practice. But um, yeah, Richard, there was a lot, there's a lot to unpack there, but yeah. do you think you want to pick out in particular to emphasize? So, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what Lara and Jennifer were saying. I think one of the things that I, I particularly agree that institutional practices and habits around expressing disagreement, reporting lines, uh, all of those things really important. The 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 thing that one of the things one of the reasons why the post office got into such a mess, Lara, wasn't so much about law, but it was about facts and evidence. And the lawyers got used to saying there's no problem with Horizon because we keep winning or settling our cases, and they were winning or settling their cases and approaching disclosure on the basis that the business kept telling them Horizon works. They weren't getting evidence that Horizon worked. They were getting lots of evidence, actually, that Horizon didn't work, but they kept ignoring it because everybody was so superficially confident that all that evidence was wrong and the system really worked. So good facts. And, and, also, and also, Richard, we must always challenge statements. Just yeah. because somebody said it doesn't mean it's accurate. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. But and there was a sort of a there was a there was a real malleability, and you see it with the private practitioners when they come in to litigate as well. They start off with an approach which is, oh, we need this evidence, we need that evidence, and very quickly they've forgotten all of that, and they're just kind of like, well, they're telling us it's fine. So we're going to run the case on the basis that it's fine. The um, uh, that's that uh, the the institutional part of that, which I don't know so much about, but John Sutherland has written and done lots of nice little videos about this sort of thing, looking at the post office stuff, is the role of audit and uh, and that relationship within organisations that have audit functions, that being properly structured can be a real friend to the business and to... That's a frontline to... of defence. You know, yeah, that's yeah. your assurance, you know, that's got to look at things for you. Yeah, and then... yeah if, you, if your business doesn't have a risk and audit committee, then see if you can get one set up. Well, it had, the post office had one. It just wasn't yeah, functioning Yeah, but I properly. mean for the audience here. Yeah, no, that that's, that sort of thing made a really big, really big difference. The other thing is, I think from talking to some of the kind, the, some of the kinds of cases that Jennifer talks about, and just watching the way that these kinds of problems unfold generally, um, uh, is that they they don't have they don't they don't present themselves as independence challenges. OK, they don't start there. They, they they become independence challenges at some point. And quite often the lawyers involved, I think, don't actually recognize that, actually. Uh, and, and so that suggests there is a need for greater self-reflection, critical scrutiny, a willingness to stand back, a willingness to think about strategy at various points along the way, not just at the beginning of a case and think, well, is, is our strategy actually really the right strategy? Is it not? actually now misleading or you know whatever there's those kinds of problems so that's that's a very hard set of things to ask of people because we once we've decided how we see the world we see the world that way and actually you actually need to be able to stand back and say you may have got that wrong and that might be involve you inviting critical scrutiny sometimes and so on and so forth the sra point i hear what jennifer hears about their helpline it, it was the law society was always the same i remember from way back when I was a trainee solicitor ringing the helpline about various things. I used to have to advise other trainees and it was just useless. Mm. Um, the uh, the SRA is at the beginning of a bit of a journey in terms of understanding how in-house in works. We're not quite sure if they're really willing to go on the journey, but they don't really understand that side of practice and, and need to be, if you like, pushed and encouraged to do that much better. Yeah, they certainly have a better role. To, well, they have a role to play and it sounds... Yeah. Need, there are so. Yeah, no, I was just going to say there are so many amazing questions, and that the person who's given the insight about regulated versus unregulated, I, I, it feels like that would be important to draw out because that is the reality. That's the reality that it's very loose. The mm. investors don't couldn't care less. So what do you do? Well, in my case, resign. Um, but that's that's the real. I'm, I'm just interested in the the perspectives that your audience is sharing in respect well, that, of how that it's for them. And that and that also sounds, um, you know, how how Lara deals with it a little bit is is the the threat that she might resign if they don't if they don't um, you know change change their approach. But um, that feels quite um, you know extreme. Um, so what I, 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 you know I I think it's easy. It, it is extreme versus your liability. So is that what you're going to win? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's either you want to carry on and be part of this, you know, problem that's going to come and bite you in the in the box, or you actually say, you know, what's the point of an in-house lawyer if your business don't listen to you? You have no confidence in what you're saying. How can you carry on? That'll be my challenge back. How can you carry on? And I do think some of this goes to the diligence phase before, and this is a very competitive market, right? The GC market's very competitive. People want to do interesting work. They want to work for mission-driven businesses, make a difference in the world. Um, and typically those businesses are very um, fast moving, um, you know, decisions, the decision, the governance around decision-making may, may be quite shallow. And they typically have quite um, immature boards in terms of governance because it's private led, it's, it's venture, they're not professional boards. So I get all of that. And I think that's a, a, a you weigh that into your decision making as you go in in the beginning. So do the diligence, talk to as many people as you can before you join and know where your line is. And if you know where your line is, then that makes everything a lot easier. But I think what often happens in the example you gave, Colvin, where people have almost been trained in the in-house environment. They've gone in junior and they've sort of just been molded by the environment. They're just surviving. I mean, honestly, every GC I know is completely, most GCs I know are completely overwhelmed with work. They don't have time to think, never mind breathe. And they're just trying to keep up. You know, AI has just landed. It's a, it's a tough role. And then there's new um, responsibilities that have been taken on, like ESG, and you know, you've got to be on top of everything. It's it's non-trivial. So in those times, it's like the preparation in the summer for the winter that will come is what will hold you. But what I'm interested in is what we can be doing together so that it doesn't just have to be a one-person thing, that there's a community backing you, that there is sort of best practice that we say is our best practice, and it's known as our best practice. And we've got the regulator that is prepared to have some kind of standing with us. Yeah. You know, it feels like there's there's a lot of shared. And I, I speak at events sometimes and I have GCs come up and tell me that they simply don't recognize what I'm saying at all, that they've never had any problems. And amazing. Yeah. I'm so glad for you. But let's let's talk about it anyway, because there are other people who do. And maybe we can come up with some structures that would help us eradicate uh, this from our reality uh, i've had gc yeah. say the same thing to me jennifer and then have their you? deputy gcs come up to me and say actually there are problems in our organization ah. and they just don't like to talk about them and i've had that so I've, that's a not uncommon thing from in my experience that the the figurehead likes to talk a particular way about things and the people slightly lower down the organization mm. oh, are yeah. a bit more um straightforward about that sort of thing if you like um uh, and, and it may partly be that they see different things because they have slightly different roles, right? So, uh, but I, I've, de I've definitely noticed that phenomenon. Can I also say, Colvin, I think that the private practice um, environment can support here. So everyone here in the audience, if you have stuff going on, call Colvin. You know, there might be people that can help you not on the clock. And I think that, that when I talk to private practice lawyers, they often tell me that they thought that something was going on and or they saw something that wasn't great, but they didn't really do anything. And I'm like, well, what's that? I mean, you weren't on the clock, so it's not your job. No, we, that's not correct. We have a societal duty here and a personal duty between ourselves. So I think that don't be afraid to just phone a friend. Um, and actually this has been suggested in, in the, the, the quick Q&A here as well. Phone a friend, literally phone anyone, phone me, uh, phone Colvin, um, and yes. you know, re re provide support to others as well. I think that's right. I think the good thing is, and I think someone did make that point that um, seeking out, um, you know, advice or comfort from other insurance lawyers, and we've got networks now that have developed over the last few years, which is which is which is great. Just on the role of external lawyers in terms of helping and providing some coverage, because um, because certainly I have absolutely done that um, in you know in, in 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 my role, and ultimately I will see my responsibility is to make the general counsel and in-house lean. East Ham team in house team look fantastic, um, but what 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 can um what can external lawyers do to help, and how should people, um, GCs in house lawyers be using them in this type of situation? I think R Richard, uh, sort of highlighted in the post office scandal that that actually the external lawyers were, were part of the problem, but I think they can also be part of the solution. 
Um, so what 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 do you think, Laura? I'll turn to you first. Um, what what do you think the external lawyers could do to to help you and provide some coverage in the event um, that there is some issue? Well, I, I think depending on the um, legal point that uh, one has gone to the external counsel for, it could be helpful, you know, in terms of the written advice, you know, putting in perspective, you know, which um, the organisation might consider. So it's not just um, literally answering um, the legal technical questions that's been, you know, asked, yeah. but, you know, something like, other in industries or sectors or clients, you know, maybe I face this sort of issue and this is what they've considered a solution. So it doesn't look as if um, maybe it's just the um, in-house counsel pushing the issue, you know, have a sort of broader, you know, perspective based on industry or sector experience. Uh, Jennifer, anything to add? Uh, yeah, a few things. One, try not to forum shop for the answer that you want that supports what the business is asking. Um, when you ask for advice from private practice, ask for advice from private practice. So, you know, it's very easy to sort of want to frame it so that you're kind of pleasing the business. And I, I think if we do that, we're not necessarily looking at questions from first principles where we're predetermining things to try to please someone, which is not correct. So I think there's a misuse of private practice that we can have. I also feel like we do have a potentially unhealthy symbiosis with law firms um, that GCs can feel a lot in-house lawyers can actually it's okay for you to take a view and um, you don't always have to have an insurance policy of, of, of being backed by private practice on, on what you can you can review the law you can interpret it and you can present it with power you don't have to have backing for for what you feel is correct um, but I would say on the other side I think there's a, as an allyship part of it and that's the relationship so um having conversations about what is actually happening for you personally within the business, I think can be an interesting and important aspect of your relationship with your, with your outside counsel. Um, and I would say from the outside counsel's point of view, you just need to be way more alert to the circumstances that your clients are experiencing. So I was really surprised uh, when I was, for example, at TransferWise, no one really phoned me to say like, hey, Jennifer, I see that there's these trends happening in the market and there's all this pressure and uh, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? It's like a totally non-strategic relationship from the private practice to me. And we're talking about some really interesting firms and some really interesting people who I adore and got a lot of value from, but there was an absence of something. So what I'm saying is be more alert, be more active, be more engaged and ask. And if you ever see anything, call it, tell them, tell the GC. What was that? In why were you being so backward in the meeting, or why did you not say that thing that needed to be said? Or I don't know. There's a there's a different relationship that's available to us if we think about what the purpose is of our collective role. Yeah, that's that that's interesting, and I I, I actually see a distinction when I'm advising UK clients and US clients actually, and and the way that um, in house lawyers in in US corporations. Uh, the relationship is different as compared to to, to the UK, and, very. and often in the US, it's very much um, they want some advice, and they will use that. And if they need to, they will take it to the board, and you follow that advice. And that's kind of how uh, I think US in in house counsel kind of use lawyers differently. I mean, the risk profile is very different in the US, um, but that I think provides some kind of coverage actually to the in house lawyer if you're using your external counsel um, in that way. Um, I've got a, uh, another question from the audience, which I'd like to um, uh, just read out. Um, um, so the question is, I'm interested in your views on the increasing link between legal and compliance functions or even risk generally. Mm -hmm. GCs are under pressure to be a partner to the business and to be commercial on the one hand and on the other hand, sign off from a compliance perspective. How can the appropriate checks and balances be built into legal departments where legal and compliance are lumped together? Mm. Great question. Lara? Lara, do you want to go? Yeah, um, yeah uh, I'll give it a go. Um, I think it's a question of, you know, being, you know, very clear because sometimes from the compliance function, the legal function has got to come in and give the interpretative um, advisory support to the approach that compliance is taking. 
but also um, what I've seen that's kind of happened in the past, you know, that sometimes when you have the two together, it's very clear when compliance is, you know, um, performing, you know, their role as the second line of defense, you know, in terms of making sure that, you know, compliance is followed and adhered to. And at the same time, being able to call out on the basis that these are the sort of legal advice, legal support, you know, that is required to do that. I think, like always, it's like, you know, having clear lines, you know, I'm very clear when, you know, compliance is doing what is expected of them, a second line of defense and law and, and the legal function is there to sort of, you know, support, you know, to make sure that the correct interpretation is being given to the, you know, approaches, you know, that second line of defense, i.e. the compliance function um, is putting across. I think both can be together. Um, sometimes regulators <laughs> don't like legal and compliance, you know, being, you know, in one, you know, function. Um, in my current role is separate, you know, and I remember when I was at Barclays, we started having legal and compliance together and then they were separated, you know, because, um, you know, the, the regulators wanted, you know, compliance to sort of maintain that solid second line of defense, you know, approach to be able to call things out. So I think, you know, it can work both ways. I think it's just having very, very clear lines um, defined. Can, can I add, this is a fantastic question. There are two assumptions in this. One is around the pressure to be commercial and the other is around the lumping together. So um, it's it's all absolutely correct. And of course you see in big businesses, some have got um, legal and compliance separate, some have got them together. Even if they're together, they're not lumped together. They are separate functions. Mm -hmm. And so you run them as separate functions with different processes. You know, in legal, you typically don't do root cause analysis as in compliance, you must. So the processes, control, methodologies, everything as to those different roles, delineate what the roles are and then describe your processes that link in with those roles. Totally, you run them separate even if you're at the top. Um, the commercial pressure is obviously a fact, but it's not something you actually need to care about in the context of delivering on your job, because your job is to, to support the business to deliver on its purpose. So everything that you do, even any challenge that you have, will start with the purpose of this business is, therefore, X. So because since X, therefore Y. Um, so everything that you do then can be framed, whether you're giving legal advice or you're running a compliance function, will be framed by reference to the purpose of the business. One of one of the purposes of the business is to deliver on its contract with society under Section 172 of the Companies Act. If you're not referencing Section 172 of the Companies Act at least monthly, you're missing a, a, an opportunity um, to, to, to back yourself. So I would say that too, that the commercial pressure is there, but actually the, the the sustainability of the business is of equal standing to the commercial pressure. So there's, there's storytelling that you can build into there that will really help you. I don't know if that helps. And also seeing all these questions, Colvin, it makes me think we could try and answer them offline if we don't get a chance Absolutely. to answer them all now. Yeah. Um, so Richard, um, is there anything else from, um, you know, the research that you've done, the learnings from the post office, um, I'm particularly thinking about, you know, um, around bias and psychology. Yeah. Um, that you think it would be worth um, highlighting in terms of understanding how you deal with some of these issues and, and how they're driven maybe by human behaviour a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's quite a lot of work on, um, uh, on how decision-making... Um, biases or problems contribute to ethical failure yeah uh, and basically the, the basic point is that it is it isn't only bad people who do bad things good people do bad things because they make mistakes yeah. and the sorts of things they do is they lean too heavily into the client's interests without realizing they do it um they are heavily influenced by um group effects social proof uh, the desire to be seen as a team player believing what everybody else believes because to push against what everybody else believes in an organization, even if there's no evidence witness horizon in the post office yeah. is just very um, difficult. Um, lawyers perhaps particularly prone to things like objectivity biases, because I see two sides of the story. I'm the most objective assessor of a situation, actually quite a risky thing to 
um, think those kinds of um, those kinds of problems. And the, it's actually very hard to know what to do about those other than to have critical friends, ways of exposing for discussion, the decision making process, making sure that you don't rely solely on your own judgment and those sorts of things in those kinds of situations. But but there there is a whole bunch of factors, risks, which we're really not generally aware of when we're taking decisions which can push us towards doing the easy thing rather than doing the right thing. Yeah. And it's not because we're lazy or immoral. It's because actually we're not thinking clearly enough in that particular moment. There's an element of self-awareness in terms of how you're making your decisions. Yeah, exactly. You know yourself, if you think about a situation where you have a bit of a conflict of interest, it's almost impossible, actually, to start to think objectively about your real decision in those circumstances because you can't untangle yourself from the conflict of interest, however real it is. Because yeah. you kind of keep tr circling back to the, am I deciding this because I've got an interest or am I deciding this because it's the right thing to do? You can't do it. It's not possible. Understood. And this, this is where I think there's a sort of simple process of as soon as you have a discomfort, that you do something with the discomfort. You don't just leave it. So you say it to someone, you discuss it, you get, get a counsel around, around the discussion, you write a little note, you know, on a Google Doc so people can contribute to it. You... You make it, you give it oxygen, you give it sunlight rather yeah. than sort of just going mm, and then later it, it becomes a thing. The but Ben Horowitz, Jordan Breslow story, which I put a link in our chat, I don't know if it can be circulated to the mm. delegates. It's a really nice little story. He, uh, Jordan Breslow said, everybody else is doing this. It just, uh, it, uh, it, it just didn't feel like. So I went and had a proper look. The look, outside lawyer said we could do it, it wasn't illegal, but I still felt it wasn't right. So I had a proper look and I worked out what was wrong with it. And that's what kept Ben Horowitz out of jail. And it was that initial moment of discomfort right. that made Jordan think, mm, I need to think about this properly. That, that intuition. Yeah. Which goes back to having time, right? So Partly because, about time. Because everyone's and trust under, as well. But everyone's under pressure, right? Everyone on this call will have too much work to do. Yeah. So it's giving yourself the space when you feel the discomfort to make that a priority. And that's an internal process, but it can become a sort of ritualized thing that you do. You make a commitment to, if I've got an itch, I'm going to scratch it. Yeah. Okay. Um, that makes sense. Um, but one minute left. Mm -hmm. uh, bear in mind everything we've talked about. What's your kind of one takeaway from this session in terms of, you know, what, what our audience should do in terms of being able to better protect themselves. What's the one piece of advice you, you, you would give given our discussion today? So I'll start with Lara first. Um, I think for me, very important um, to try and build trust, you know, that can give you that leverage, you know, to be able to um, speak up when things are not going right so that you can protect yourself to sort of um, have this sort of change you know you want to see happen Richard I would say as well as building trust practice independence yeah mm. live it every day in the way you yes. give your advice the way you talk to your teams practice those Thank conversations you, yeah no <laughs> and lastly Jennifer it sounds like you do Lara <laughs> remember why you're a lawyer and be proud of that excellent I love that okay that's the perfect note to finish on um, I just want to say thank you so much to the panel. That was uh, just uh, an engaging and insightful discussion. And thank you, everyone, for um, attending. We um, hope you enjoyed it and we look forward to seeing you at the next session. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.